I'm Jennifer Brown, Director of the Center for Literary Arts at Frostburg State University. Along with the Lewis J. Ort Library and the Allegheny County Public Library, I'd like to welcome you to this, the kickoff reading of our 14th annual Western Maryland Independent Literature Festival, otherwise known as Indie Lit. Before we begin in earnest, I'd like to thank those organizations, the Allegheny Arts Council, the Community Trust Foundation, the City of Frostburg, and Frostburg State University's President, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Department of English and Foreign Languages and Literature, who support our work in bringing poets such as Indran Amertanayagam to you. You'll hear the poems in just a few moments, and Amertanayagam's fascinating biographical information is available to you below our YouTube screen. But I was reading a review of the migrant states and wanted to share this sentiment from John Wall Barger, who writes in the Kenyan Review that Amir Tanayagam, like Whitman, the most expansive American and guiding spirit of the migrant states, adopts a world encompassing voice, taking on the dual role of poet and village elder, helping noiselessly, patiently, to connect us where we didn't know we needed connecting, breaking down the divisions between us. Amir Tanayagam asks, so what does the migrant state? And elsewhere answers, we need open borders everywhere. Please join me in welcoming Indran Amir Tanayagam. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Prosper. This is uh, uh, really a, uh, a supreme, a great honor to be to be reading and and kicking off this festival. Um, I, the migrant story is is very uh, close to me, and um, ever since I I became a migrant, you know, I've been thinking about migration, and um, and this book, the migrant states, is I guess a kind of culmination of many years of work. Um, reflecting and writing in America about what America and migration means. Um, and so Walt Whitman was a natural um, friend uh, and guide in, in, in the writing of these poems. Um, his 200th birthday took place last year. And um, on the occasion of the 200th birthday, I wrote this poem, Walt 200. Break the locks, unleash the mind, Walt Whitman has left Pomanok. He is abroad. He is sitting among us in our soul. He flies the post with pigeons and the giant freight planes. He hops freight trains and rides into Mexico. He is on a PO cruise visiting St. Kitts and Barbados. He has joined the Merchant Marine. He sails into Guantanamo. He throws fish into the sea in search of whales. He has the biggest, longest beard in the world. He jives, thrives, cavorts, shimmers. He is 200 years old today, and he does not give a flying rat. He is in your mind, Mr. President, even if you cannot smother or scratch or squeeze him out. He is gloriously spirit, gadfly, rabbit, and sloth. He nurses our democratic wounds. He knows how to write history from the pebbles view, the side glance of the wren, the snake hanging in the tree. He is black and white and all shades of gray. He is our friend and guide, and he will elect us every time we fall down. Let us go back to Pomanok with what we've learned these 200 years. Let us go back to set forth again, Walt Whitman in our backpack. Um, these are heady times, these are uh, rare times we're living in, and times where the renewal must take place, you know. And Walt Whitman is a good poet to read at these times where we are nursing our democratic wounds. Ode to and from Whitman. Ezra said you were pig-headed, but he recognized that you made the new wood. 
We have been carving for more than 150 years since you first painted the leaves of grass. Now we have plastics on our mind, floating islands of waste, stuffing stomachs of fish and whales, weighing a third of all fish in the sea, and by 2050, even more than all of those fish. What would Walt say now? Turn his attention to water, to streams and rivulets, rivers and lakes spilling into the plastic-ridden sea? What would he say about the inheritance of Roosevelt? Who is turning in his bed? Would he monitor delivery of babies sailing out of the birth canal, the ninth month midnight to be abandoned at a hospital door in the alleyway of Walmart by a young mother driven mad with anxiety, guilt, fame, shame, and fear? Would he say that the mother can murder and create? Would he say that if that mother had the right to choose and the means, she should be allowed to stop cells multiplying before they become embryos or further along open eyes and start to taste spices consumed by their host? Roe versus Wade, Whitman, his grand, contains multitudes. He did not reject the Negro or prostitute. He saw man and God in a blade of grass. This poem is for a panel on pan, on nature, on the transcendent spirit, God or sprite, wood genie. What courses through the blood of a steved or and a banker, a rabbit and a leaping hare, a sloth and a panther, life, yes, an impending death. Imagine driving along a highway at 70 miles an hour. You must have thought at least once, what if you swerved into the guardrail to escape a deer across the median into incoming traffic, to kill oneself, to be killed, to have the hand on the button of your own desire and fate. I am large, I contain multitudes. I will roar through this life and will not stop until I stop. Moloch be damned. The military industrial complex be damned. America, go bother somebody else. I have more than two dollars in my pocket, but I'm not satisfied with a coffee at Starbucks. This is a relative poem, an elusive child, a homage and a diversion. Can you spot the antecedents? Or shall we protest again in our time? So he from black and I from white cloud free, the old arguments and quarrels course still through our psyches. Walt is contemporary as a blade of grass, a cow allowed to chew its cud in a field, an organic tomato, a wild mushroom. Walt is relevant as a raw food juice designed to pick you up every morning. So to say you can go local, bring the chains of distribution home. You can go abroad and walk to the greengrocer, live in the world and in a small space of earth to learn to bear the beams of love. William Blake gave us that adage. Walt said, there was never any more inception than there is now, nor any more youth or age than there is now, and will never be any more perfection than there is now, not any more heaven or hell than there is now. Let us seize the now. <laughs> Let us go then, you and I, seizing the now, moving ahead. You know, we are living in this time of, of the virus of COVID and, and such devastating loss here in America and around the world. And, and yet we have to find a way to restore our faith in our, in our ability, you know, to sustain ourselves and, and, and life on this planet. Um, I lived on an island. I've always lived on islands. And I lived on, in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. I lived in England, in Hawaii, in the Hawaiian Islands, and in Manhattan, and in Hispaniola. Um, so the years in Manhattan were important to me. And there were poets I met there who, who shaped me, who gave me um, uh, language who gave me, who inspired me to move ahead. I, I'd like to read uh, a poem now um, for one of those poets, also an islander in a sense. Um, um, uh, his name, Mervyn Taylor. And I met Mervyn in New York many years ago. 
This one's called Carnival Coming. I'm telling you, carry the torch now. Kamau be gone, Derek before him. But you are walking still on the savannah and back to Belmont, your belly flat to spice the chana, stir cow heel into the soup. You have always cooked your own food, writing perfect miniatures, stories of little people in little houses with no back door, shaping the land, keeping lovers hand in hand on the beach. Now the virus has entered along with migrants and visitors. Everybody is afraid. Everybody thinking, where did this community handoff begin? And you are there saying, stop sowing fear of the other, of the wide world beyond the back door. Stop saying the Lord cometh. Stop talking plague and black death. But I am saying everybody so easily, and we, without a thought, blind to walls going up, fortress Europe, fortress Peru, fortress United States. Politicians say these are temporary to stop SARS-CoV-2. But evil makes evil in its name. People blocked from their dream, the promised land and illusion. What was the world like, I ask, in 1999? What will our world become after the vaccine when planes start to fly and islands welcome the necessary tourist dollars? and Benetton's socialism and the United Nations jostle to become fashionable once more. And you walking the savannah, imagining the next, the next mask you will sew for the mother of all carnivals. For you, Mervyn, in Trinidad, a moment. And on that island, I wrote this poem from Migrant States uh, called Thinking of the Island, called Prelude. To live on the island, satisfied basic needs, poetry readings in the evenings, noodled curries, belly dancing and love and gardens, famous writers on street corners, monuments, chestnuts, ice and hibiscus, movies filmed in the fruit market and paintings in grand salons and love and smacking bites of a burger with a pint, the jeweled eye of a fish, a tailor who survived the number branded on his arm, the delight of lingering over a glass of wine, a chat in love, sunrise and sunset over two splendid rivers. I feel like moving back and forth from the book and, and some recent poems, because the poet is only as good or as bad as his or her most recent poem, you know, I, it's a challenge one faces, um, one puts before yourself every day writing. Um, I'd like to read too from a, a, a new manuscript I'm working on to do with running, but th this poem is called Voicemail Music. Loved hearing the sweet register of your voice, full of light, a robin flitting upon frets and keys, strings and piano lifting me up, giving me leave to write to you, to everybody saying thank you for checking in, for my heart leaping. And, and this one, um, which um, is also about, uh, uh, to a friend, uh, all these are to dear, dear people to me, um, um, and this, this particular friend uh, is now in England. Um, the poem is called A Special Tie. The choice remains to stay private or go public. I had resolved this matter in New York after you went to Managua to take a look at the revolution. The twin towers, symbols of permanence entered the poem. They exploded via airplane on 9-11 and the revolution became Ortega's dictatorship. But we did not think of every possible turning then. Friends, me from a Catholic grammar school, and you, a well-established emigre, but studying at a comprehensive class divisions of English schools, I think now a subject for historians. But property offers security, comfort. 
Who owned the towers? Who owns democracy burning in the tyrant's eyes? How quaint to talk of tyrants, as if we did not know then how the story would end before it began again. Hence, American optimism, faith renewed, friendship sustained. I am an optimist, you know, uh, and, uh, and I, I like the notion of being an American optimist. Um, I, I, I believe deeply that we can heal the divisions um, and we can move ahead uh, with a civil discourse as we go towards the election. <clears throat> I'm also a religious American optimist. And um, in that light, here's this poem, The Right Path. Let us roll America. Let us not look back. Let us seize the fellow by the absent coat tail. Let us reveal the traipsing emperor nude. And let us remember and defend the rights of our virus dead. But let us do so with respect, with love. Why? Because Jesus says so. Why? Because we are not jackals and hyenas. Why? Because we have to get back on the road to the promised land. <clears throat> One of the great uh, Americans who passed recently, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I, I wrote this poem inspired by my dear friend and poet uh, and lawyer, Sarah Cahill Maron, um, after she left a pencil on, at the memorial outside the, uh, the Supreme Court. And uh, the poem is called Pencil. And I'm just uh, going to find it now. Um, pencil. There is a time to mourn and a time to review the cards and cast them again on the table, trusting God to guide your hand. To say this pencil you left with roses, chrysanthemums, and lilies in a riot of passionate flowers before the Supreme Court will be picked up by a girl after the period of mourning, not to be conserved in the Smithsonian's Museum of American History, but to write the story of a young lawyer come to Washington to interpret laws with grace, acuity, and impartiality to the best of her ability until such time as their articulation becomes almost unnecessary. So ingrained they would become in the social conscience of Americans walking then freely. Um, <clears throat> So you see, I, I, I feel very uh, close the, no, the responsibility to, to respond to, to the world, uh, to, to what's going on in our society. And, and, and I will not cede the, the place of the poet in that, in that conversation. So the poet is uh, part of the, the discourse, you know, and I hope contributing to uh, civilizing that discourse. Um, I seem to have lost, uh, 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 are we all there? Okay, I've, I've lost the image. Okay, here we are, yes, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll go back to um, Migrant States. <clears throat> the book is published by Hanging Loose Press, which uh, gave me a home way back when with my first book, The, my, um, the Elephants of Reckoning. And they have been a, a great uh, uh, solace to me and, and, and guide in talking about uh, um, village elders. The, the press has been a village elder for me in the village, in the American village. Um, and <clears throat> this is the latest uh, book. Um, I, will, I think I, I have a few more minutes. I'll read now uh, from a section of the book. Um, that has to do with, uh, with Haiti. Actually, this is America writ large here, you know, Haiti, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, all are geographies in this 
in this American book. <clears throat> and, um, and that's important for me because as you know, uh, abroad, uh, we call ourselves Americans and, and people, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they question us, they wonder what, you know, I mean, America, we are, we too are Americans, you see. Uh, um, and it's important for us to, to remember that. The avocado season is over. The season of avocados is over. The most beautiful girl in town is about to marry a man across the water. My brother is busy with his manuscript. Time to share ideas in a book has gone to the country without a hat. Accept reality. Don't live anymore in fantasy. You are getting along in years but have only spoken Creole for two. You have a great long life ahead. Think, reflect, tell all their new families, congratulations, good luck, then write again about your life in Haiti when the avocado was in bloom. Inevitably, uh, a book of poems is also a book of love songs to one's, to the people you love, one loves. And, and to my case, uh, I have been blessed with many, uh, with much love and, and, and uh, I'd like now to read uh, two poems, um, one for my son and one for my daughter. Um, the poem for my son, um, who, uh, by the way, designed the, the book, the, the cover of the book, and has done the same with, with um, my other recent books, the uh, in French, surely nostalgic and others. He um, many years ago, when he was visiting um, his mother and uh, and he were in Florida, and I was working in in Monterey in Mexico. And during a visit, just before he left, I wrote this poem. Oh, I wrote this poem thinking about that moment. It's called Summer Chess for Anandan. You go now and I am sad. And the sadness will spill into late summer and autumn until we meet again when the leaves fall and chestnuts smack our memories alive. And you ask, Dad, did you always walk in Regent's Park when leaves turned red and yellow? And the morning bristled, and the sun seared, let left, yet left your skin cold. A cold sun, Dad. I feel it now. This summer that I thought would go slow has turned now into a sprinter's dash. And what's to do? Yes, write and fill days with friends and games and sums until next summer, until the next time we go to bed and know there's no morning flight, and your queen and rook are ready to trap my king. And now um, for Lola, uh, who is uh, strapping 14 years old now and um, in Paraná in Argentina with her mother Eugenia. Um, the poem is called Morning Mass Halloween for Lola. Hush tones, place of worship, early morning. A woman kneeling in the pew could not get up. The priest brought her communion, then another parishioner called for an ambulance. The fireman, a friend of the ambulance driver, arrived in his fire truck. They worked together naturally. What to do now? Walk to the font, dip fingers in holy water, then go out to my car. Paramedic her on a stretcher, pump her heart, wheel her away to the hospital. Life is coming to its end. A repeat. In my dad's case, his heart stopped while he kneeled at a pew. Nobody could revive it. He would have loved to see my daughter smiling as she guards the witch's cauldron this Halloween. Sweets in hand. Um, I'm just checking the time. 
I guess I have a what uh, maybe time for another poem or two. I'll I'll do one more from the book and then finish with a poem from memory, um, which I like to recite. Uh, going back to Whitman, who shows up throughout the book, this poem is called um, The Emotion Again. I asked the panel, the audience, what next? We have finished celebrating Walt Whitman's 200th birthday. Who will lead us into the next century? Do we find the driver in our own batteries? Energy coursing through cells from foods we eat for body and mind. Like this delicious feast finished now, 10 days at summer's beginning to honor the founder of our Republic of Letters. Not the first, but the most expansive American who stretched his imagination to encompass the continent and traveled beyond to India, to the moon, to the sun and stars, into the interior constellation in a leaf of grass. Walt Whitman, we do not want the party to end. We wish to keep stroking your gray beard, raiding, reading the day's news out loud as you lay dying in Camden, bedridden, reported on almost daily by the Times. If you had drunk milk punch, broth, and twice when you seemed to have kicked the bronchial pneumonia, eaten a mutton chop, you dropped out of the news too when the paper thought you had improved enough to live without their noting every food and visitor, brother George, sister-in-law, biographer, favorite niece, Jessie, and your final physician, Dr. McAllister. Your last words, a request to attendant Fritzinger, worry, shift, roll over Walt Whitman. You told the doctor, who asked if you were in pain? No, almost inaudibly. A wisp of smoke floating out of the row house into the street, mixing with the air, falling later on as rain, in poems and songs, recollected in tranquility, again and again. I've always wanted to write a line like roll over, you know, you know the song roll over Beethoven <laughs> from uh, way back when. So here, roll over Walt Whitman. Um, I'll finish with a, a short poem that Alistair Reed helped me with once and I'm very grateful to him. Um, it's called You Must Love. You must love the land when you leave to build your house on the sea. Love what's lost, the mango tree burning in the garden, the curious noose of the familiar coat of arms. Love the ball turning strong, spinning in a dark, faraway land. Love the tongue you'll never again speak that wrapped you and bled you and dried up some every day on the other side of the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for that reading. Uh, which was just lovely. Uh, we do have a few remarks um, so far in the chat. Uh, Susanna Case tells you hello. Um, Ravi Shankar says, congratulations, Indra in the Migrant States is a terrific new book. Uh, Mervyn Taylor says, the mother of all carnivals, yes. And uh, go on to the country without a hat, lovely. Um, I let our viewers know that uh, our local viewers know that Main Street Books is carrying our local independent bookstore is carrying the migrant states and Nina Forsyth replied to say great I've really been enjoying the reading and uh, Susanna Case again says thank you uh, good reading. Wonderful. Uh, well, yeah. Who One are you friends? <laughs> from uh, Riverfeet Press. Thanks. Uh, great words. Uh, thanks for sharing. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll just respond to the notion of the, having gone to the country without a hat. As you see, I'm not wearing a hat. And, <laughs> the, and uh, I haven't worn a hat in public uh, readings uh, ever since this virus began. It's a weird little thing that started with me. I don't know why. I used to wear my hat uh, everywhere at every reading. And thank you, Mervyn, for giving me the hat. 
and and giving me helping me as, as you do so many poets with um, even this life without a hat you know we have to we have to manage to live on our own without a without our hats you know it's uh, it's an important thing i i've noticed that you too have not you worn a hat in in recent reading so let's let's start the hatless poets society you know and you know in the notion of a hat is interesting in in haiti because the country without a hat is actually a rather uh, a place where you go uh, when you when you leave the this life the mortal coil and you go to the place without a hat but of course you never really leave the mortal coil because uh, you, you you your state changes you become a zombie and you but but you're always around and you'll come back um, i i find haiti uh, a renewal, place of renewal, of, of refreshing um, the notion. I, when I first got to the island, I, I, a friend there told me, met for the first time, she said, you, you were born here about 500 years ago and you've come back, you see, and you'll come back again. So uh, that sense of, of place is so important. Uh, maybe when you, when your original place was, is, is, it becomes even more so. And in my case, the original place uh, doesn't even exist as a, the, the notion of Ceylon uh, is no longer, um, the Tamil uh, country is no longer uh, there. Um, so um, the Tamil country is now uh, a metaphor. It's, uh, it's a way of life um, in, in the new world for me. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> We, uh, we do have a, a question from Jordan, uh, who says, gracias. Uh, he's, he says, as a Spanish major, I'm interested in what you learn about a poem when you go to translate it. What insights does translation offer you? You know, I, I mentioned earlier Alistair Reed. He was a great translator and, and a poet. Who, uh, he used to say he, he would wake up every morning and limber himself to go up translating five or six poems before he went on with his writing day. I mean, translating is a part of his life and it's now a part of my life. I, I, I mean, I, I, of course, depend on translations as a growing up as a young poet. I read Alistair Reed's translations of Neruda and Borges I, uh, and they were critical to my formation as a poet. So, uh, a translator is a bridge between two languages and um, and without bridges we don't know the other side you know and so the bridge is important we have to cross bridges and build bridges to to learn about each other translator is is a very important has a very important role in 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 helping us understand uh, each other and uh, and then when you yourself become acquire the language of the other, uh, you can start questioning the translator, you know, and then it's a very healthy, rich, enriching dialogue with books, a different kind of dialogue. You're reading along and you say, well, I wouldn't have said it this way. And then and then you would say it your own way. And then the translation becomes renewed. They say every translation has to be renewed every 10 years or something. So, so it's a healthy... Um, mental uh, cultural ex uh, exercise you know translating and we need more of it actually uh, in this country we have many books uh, that um, many poets from around the world for example who who don't exist in english and uh, so i invite uh, those who listen and those who are working on translations to um, to engage more and more in, in that, their, their very necessary work. Also, the, the Beltway Poetry Quarterly, which I edit uh, along with Sarah uh, Maron, is, is, a, is a journal now that uh, welcomes translations. And uh, so if there are translators out there who would like to send work, please do uh, the original poem and the translation. Um, so uh, translation, it's also a matter of letting the self, the ego go a little bit, you know, you become the voice of the poet you're translating, uh, you're an interpreter. Uh, uh, so you have to uh, know where you 
your voice stops and where the voice of the translated uh, begins, you know, and try to respect that. And, and I do have one small thing I would like to say, uh, try to respect the meaning as much as possible of the original poem, uh, even more so, uh, I mean, the meaning and the music together, um, certainly, but uh, try not to forget the meaning. Um, so we don't quite have another question, although Susanna Case uh, implores you to bring back the hat. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering if you might be willing to read one of your poems in French. Uh, uh, sure, I would. I would love to. And and for for Susanna Case and and anyone else interested, I will put on the hat. So here we go. And that's Mervyn's hat, by the way. Um, I will read, uh, this is from Solil Nostalgique, which is on the Nostalgic Island. And it's uh, a book I'm obviously very close to, and um, it's written uh, about, uh, inspired by love and, and a place I love. And um, what can I say? It's just, uh, it's a book that, uh, uh, that is uh, part of my 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 soul, and I I, I will read uh, uh, this poem called Le Pays à Côté, which would mean the country beside us. So, viens avec moi, la porte est ouverte, la citerne pleine, et il y a tout une île pour explorer, un univers dans la mer et sous la terre, mais en même temps rebondit la question. For combien de temps? Un mois, un an, une vie. Et si le chat a neuf vies, pourquoi pas l'homme à l'étranger, de pays en pays, jusqu'à l'arrivée au pays sans chapeau? La roue de l'enterrement dans le cœur du nœud en centre-ville. A very rough translation would be, come with me, the door is open, the gas tank full, and there's a whole island to, to explore, a universe in the sea and on the earth. But at the same time, the question surges up for how much time, a month, a year, a life. And if the cat has nine lives, why not man abroad from country to country, going from country to country until he arrives at the country without a hat, the road of the, the street of burial in the heart of the knot in the center of the city. Um, so my La Peya Cote. And I'll, I'll read one more from here, uh, which has to do again with the theme of migration, which uh, also is found in my French poetry. Um, L'Egyptien aujourd'hui. Je me trouve dans les vagues sans repère et sans bateau pour me sauver. Et toi, qui a coupé la tumeur avec un couteau. Ton sang est renversé dans la mer aussi. La mer rouge, la faim d'un Égyptien, son orgueil tourné en désespoir, la terre non promise pour lui. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a, a poem about, I mean, the Egyptian could be, the Palestinian could be, the Tamil, it, it's, it's the, the migrant without a, place. Um, I find myself in the waves without an anchor, without a boat to help to save me and you who cut the tumor with a knife. Your blood is spilt in the sea as well. The Red Sea, the end of an Egyptian, his pride turned into despair, the tear that the earth no longer promised for him. Um, I mean, I'm playing with thinking about the Egyptians and the biblical Egyptians, but, but uh, that's, the, that's the danger of having grown up with the Bible, it, it, it becomes part of your, your language. The, the, I, I don't really believe it's the danger, I think it's, it's perfectly fine, but that's a subject for dispute and, and debate, you know, how much you are influenced by what you read. I mean, we're all speaking the language of Shakespeare, you know, and the language of the King James Version of the Bible and so on. 
and that's all fine. Yates, um, Sylvia Platt, so many uh, uh, languages that have formed us, that form our, the way we express ourselves. And that's why I think even more uh, translation is important to just keep reading and keep exploring, crossing those bridges between uh, and, and discovery. So, um, thank you so much for for this time. And I'm um, I'm uh, if there aren't any other questions, I'd be happy to uh, just say uh, in the way of closing that we are. Uh, oven more than ever uh, in need of um, a, a good drink <laughs> and a good and a good poem and and also uh, I hope all listening will go out and 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 vote in these elections um, to come. Thank you. I could not, uh, couldn't agree more wholeheartedly. Uh, thank you again, Indran, so much for sharing uh, this reading with us and, and the generosity of your time and your thought. Um, and I just want to, because this is the kickoff reading for our Indie Lit Festival, I want to make sure that I say uh, that we have many other events happening tomorrow. And I would encourage people to look at our website, uh, the Frostburg State University Center for Literary Arts, uh, look at our social media, and also you can uh, just take a look at this YouTube channel to see the events that are happening uh, tomorrow. So we hope you'll join us then. And Indran, thank you. And uh, have, have a good evening, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.